Welcome to the Sunset Safari. We're trying to show you one of the most spectacular things that you don't normally see during the day. But of course, this is proving to be a little bit difficult. Now, just through one of these little bushes is a little bush baby who's watching us. And because it's been so cold, it's decided to come out into the sun. But then I'm just gonna try to swing my... And this is literally right next to where we park. Okay, I think this and this so it's actually in the garden of mike and candace who live our neighbors by the way i'm brent Dio smith we have vm dawnbank on camera this evening we have jamie patterson and jandre out in the other vehicle and rebecca and louise in final control okay now back to the bush baby search okay so i'm going to take this branch here i'm going to go into that little thicket there is what i can see okay them. I'm going to try to show you it's come out a bit. Oh, no, look, 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 look. Do we see it there? No. Okay. I don't know. It's, it's, this is getting quite difficult because he's just peering. I can just see his ears looking at us. So if we come out, Vim, let's try to see where this can go. Uh, junction of little branches. Is, can we go a bit further that way? Okay. Let me just have a look now if I can see. So, they come down a little bit, down a little bit, yeah, it's just back through there where we saw that little fly buzzing. Okay, this is proving to be quite difficult. So, what I think we should do is maybe go, so, say hello to Jamie uh, while we try to get these bush babies on screen. But it has, hopefully will be managed, they're just in the most peculiar spot. So, let's go say. Uh, hello to Jamie, and hopefully VM and I will have the little bush baby that I can see peering at me shortly. <laughs> I'm quite cross with myself because I completely forgot about the bush babies. I even went and scouted where the vehicle could go and then promptly got in, forgot about it, and off I drove. But a very good afternoon to you all. Starting off our afternoon drive with a lovely, what was a pair of lilac-breasted rollers, is now a single lilac breasted roller. And I always feel that one should always take advantage of these beautiful birds and just stop and have a look at their stunning colours. Good afternoon to you all. My name is Jamie and I have Chandre on camera with me this afternoon. We're going to head out into the wilderness and see if we can challenge Brent to his challenge that he laid down this morning, which was to find as many different species of cat as possible. Now this morning he said that he was on a cat challenge, which Vim and myself promptly, I think safe to say we won that, since we found an African wild cat, the first African wild cat sight in a considerable period of time. I say that like we got anything else but very, very lucky. But we were fortunate enough to spend two and a half hours with it this morning, incredibly relaxed, surprisingly so was something that absolutely made my, probably has made my week, and I'm grinning from ear to ear. And it is exciting that we shall be discussing this evening, amongst other things, with Fireside, or on Fireside, the last half an hour of our show this evening, of our Sunset Spot, will be, will be a Fireside chat. We'll just see Brent and myself this evening. Sam has gone on leave, we'll chat a little Okay, so we have repositioned to the spot. Unfortunately, we can't see their cute little faces, but we can see their little furry bottoms. So mm -hmm. we're just trying to get the camera in. Oh, I got a lot of problem now. I'm on maximum tilt. Uh, we're on maximum mm -hmm. tilt, so we are. Um, we'll just have a look. If we, if we, oh, they're just above us. I, move. I can't really move it. All right, there we go. Vim has fixed it. He is a genius. And there we go. If it's on that branch and we go, them there. Yes, look at that. You can just see the little bit of fur. So with this cold weather, you can just see the little finger as well, clinging to the tree. So with this cold weather, they've decided to come out of their little nest and sleep 
and it's a little bit warmer, and they were all basking in the sun. There's about five of them there. Now, I'd love to take, claim the credit for spotting them, but unfortunately it wasn't. Uh, Lex spotted them and let us know exactly where they were. So look at that. You can just see him there. You can see his little finger in the top sort of right center of screen. There it is, just holding on to the, to the buffalo thorn bark. So as I said, there's about five of them there. The rest are sleeping on top of the branch, so we can't really see them. But they're in a little huddle, all cuddled together. Now, bush baby families often sleep together, and then they head off foraging. The youngsters will generally stay with mom, but once they get sort of adolescence, they do forage individually. So this is the tiny little South African bush baby, or South African galego, and a real cutie. And it's not often we get to see them during the day, but hopefully if they keep roosting in this area to get a bit of warmth, we'll find them before drive one afternoon uh, when they'll be out in the open a bit more. Okay, so we're gonna head out and drive. We actually haven't even left the car park yet, basically. And we're gonna just get out of here, watch the uh, antenna. Okay, we just need to drop the antenna over to get out of here. There we go. So, Jamie's African wildcat sighting this morning has made me very jealous, but on a positive note, it's prompted a little bit of a challenge for us. Now, the challenge is, how many different species of cat can we get in one day on safari? So, we normally, if we're really lucky, get three, but we're sitting in a unique position now that we might possibly be able to get four. So, uh, we are going to try to slowly make our way down towards Cheetah Plains. So Hubert carried on following Karula's tracks, for those of you who were on the Sunrise Safari. She unfortunately went into this myriad of little drainage systems uh, near the Gallego camp, and uh, we cannot get a vehicle in there. So that is very unfortunate, but there's always a chance that another leopard might be about. So I think to try and get four different cats today. The safe ones, obviously the next safest one after the lion, which we've already got today, and hopefully we'll have again, is the leopard. So we're gonna look for leopard and maybe take a meander down to Cheetah Plains to see if we can get some cheetah there as well. Also, don't forget, it's fireside chat this evening. So always a great, great time around the fire, having a chat, catching up. Just gonna do a bit of a catch up on the week. Uh, about the hyenas and about leopards and of course about that wildcat sighting. So if you have any questions in particular about those that you would like answered on Fireside Chat, uh, drop us an email, questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. And hopefully the ladies in final control uh, will get your questions ready for Fireside Chat. And it is a beautiful, beautiful winter's day. Uh, it's about 25 degrees Celsius, which is 70 something Fahrenheit. And we are back up there. Not the dove on the right, fam, the, the little bird on the left. Do you want me to go back? No, it doesn't work. There we go. Ah, a gray headed sparrow. There you go, just in case no one's got a grey-headed sparrow on their bird lists, there's one with that beautiful deep blue sky behind it. Uh, definitely the most common sparrow species out in the bush. Pretty little fellas. You can see that bill that's designed for seed eating, so they'll eat grass seeds mostly, so uh, something must have spooked or it's on the look for something because normally you see them on the ground. Here we go, grey-headed sparrow. 
I can just almost feel big cats this evening. As I said, we've had a bit of a tough time with them recently, so it's about time they sort of do us a favor and start making themselves a little bit easier to find, lying on top of termite mounds, walking down the roads and such. Unfortunately, it seems like Jamie's got a gremlin, so she's just dashed back to camp quickly uh, for the tech department to have a look at that. So, Vim and I will keep you company until she gets back. Now, it's amazing, we see lots of different murlers around and some of them are look really, really green like this one. You can just see the first start of a bit of yellow showing. And then other murlers you'll see have already started losing leaves very heavily and lots of yellow leaves. Now, that quite often just depends on their access to underground water. So, the murlers that are sitting on good underground water, their leaves tend to last a little bit longer as we move into the dry season and the ones that aren't lose their leaves a little bit quicker. Of course, this could also be rainfall, but the rainfall's been pretty, pretty uniform through this area uh, this year, and that is a very little rainfall. So I think it's more to do with the underground water this year, and you'll see which marillas have access to better water. And here's a perfect example. We've just gone past that marilla tree. It almost looks still green, a few bits of leaves turning. And here we have another marula tree, no more than 60 or 70 meters from it. And you can see almost all the leaves have already fallen off. I do love these winter skies. They just are incredible. There's literally not a cloud around. And I have spotted a bird of prey circling. Let's see if we can get a bit closer to it. Where did that bird go? I just saw it flying there. It looked like it could be an eagle rather than a vulture. Um, maybe a snake eagle. Now, when you're birding, a lot of birding is recognizing the sort of individual shapes of birds. So, it, it, a lot of it's instinctive and a lot of it's just practice. Oh, hello. Where did you guys come from? Looks like the edge of a breeding herd of buffalo or buffalo that have been harassed by lions. As I can see a female, a calf. There we go. And behind them is a young male and then only one big dugger boy. Now, if it is a big breeding herd, we should hear the rest of them lowing and moaning as they walk through the bush and they also the rustle. But I don't see it yet. So we've just got that old boy, big old dugger boy there. And there only seems to be four here. Now, when you find groups of buffalo like this and a cow and calf, and not a, not a baby, baby calf, but a young calf, and not in a big group, I mean, or not even in a small group. It generally means they probably have been harassed by lions recently. And those big herds can get separated and split. And I'm pretty sure they'll be wanting to join up. Let's just move forward.
Sorry about this, everybody. Perhaps something has pushed over the Gauri repeater, just like the elephants have pushed over this marula tree. Our technical team is rushing around madly trying to fix it, and we'll be back with you as soon as we can. Hi everyone, we are experiencing technical difficulties, but... Well, apologies for that. We're back. It seems like we've got it. We had a gremlin of our own, but VM whacked it on the head very quickly and it ran away screaming. So hopefully it's told all the other gremlin friends that it better stay away from us. Oh, it's Nelson! Nelson, hello, boy. Let's get him to the one. I'm pretty sure it's him. It looked like he was not looking at us out of his left eye. The one-eyed, one-horned impala with one ambition to avoid Queen Karula. So as we actually were worried that he had expired for a while, but he keeps surviving and he's all on his own. You can see the damage to his eye there. It's almost that sort of a the milky blue lens over that left eye. There we go. You can, you can just make it out. And you can see he's blind in that eye. Now, compared to what it looked like when it was the injury was first there, it was quite an impressive injury. So good old Nelson is a real survivor. He does tend to hang around this area, so nice to see Nelson. Now, of course, just in case you guys are not sure why he's called Nelson, I think there was a famous British admiral in the Napoleonic Wars, uh, Lord Horatio, uh, Lord Admiral Horatio, some lots of other big hyphenated words in between Nelson, and uh, he had one eye, one arm, and one ambition. And that was to defeat Napoleon. I think my history, which is a bit rusty, serves me correct. Uh, he was incredibly, incredibly important in the Battle of Waterloo. Well, curious one says she thinks everyone was too excited after this morning's drive to plug in the camera batteries for charge. Curious one, that I can guarantee was not a problem. Our cameramen are so such finely tuned machines that as soon as we drive back, the car gets plugged in. So the cameras don't run off batteries unless there's a slight problem. Uh, we have a, back, a bank of batteries here that power the camera and all the other things that make the zigama zags and the jigama jags get all the way to you at home. So that is definitely not what happened. Uh, unfortunately, you must remember we are out in the bush and we do bounce around and go through thickets and, and every now and then we do need some TLC. The vehicles have been going through a serious weekend of TLC. So I'm back in Rusty. Jamie is in Wendy. They've had some special doctors come down from the big city to have a look inside to their insides and we've identified and fixed most of the problems and there's a few small problems that are not too serious that will be fixed as soon as the spares arrive later in this week coming forward so it is that time of the year 
when we're doing some TLC to the vehicles and equipment. And uh, we're about, as the crow flies, about 450 kilometers from the big city where the special car doctors come from. But uh, in terms of time, uh, it's about a six hour drive to get out here uh, to where we are. And fortunately, the best mechanics seem to live in the big city and not out here in the bush. So I'm very fortunate that the guys could come down and work this whole weekend to help us get the cars up and running to their full potential. We've got to be nice to them. They are old ladies now. The youngest is Rusty. Now, as I was saying, they're old ladies. The youngest one, which is Rusty. And it is... Who's Rusty? 1997. So, a few yards under the hood. And... <laughs> Curious one's wondering, uh, does finding a cat at camp uh, count as a cat for the, the cat day? No, it doesn't. And Curious one, you will not find a cat at any of the camps. Domestic cats are very, very bad for the environment, especially out here. Now, you saw that beautiful African wildcat with Jamie. One of the biggest threats to African wildcat is hybridization with domestic cats. That one didn't look like it had. I mean, those beautiful pink ears, uh, which is very uncommon and also much more long limbed than a domestic cat. One of the, but one of the biggest threats with wild cats is that their genetic purity has been tainted by domestic cats. Also, uh, domestic cats bring disease that the wild animals are not used to. So uh, little feline things that a lot of the domestic cats might hold the immunities to an African wild cat won't and they'll be wiped out. So no cats out here in the bush. And also what happens when you keep pets like cats out in the bush, they tend to disappear. Uh, normally at the hands of an eagle, a martial eagle, or even a African hawk eagle will eat a domestic cat. And speaking of cats, Fiona in the UK. Welcome, Fiona. Great to have you on the back of the vehicle with us. Fiona would like to know if any of us ever seen a caracal at Juba. Alas, dear Fiona, we have not. It is one of those that sits on the bucket list. I've only ever seen one caracal in the Sabi Sands, and that was about 15 kilometers to the south of us here. And yeah, that's the only caracal I've seen. I've seen more serval, wildcat, Honey badger. Actually, the only thing I've seen, I've seen one caracal and one striped polecat in the Sabi Sands. And striped polecats are sort of real big wish list on that little predator challenge I'm having with myself. See how many of the potential sort of 20 predators that we're likely to find on Juma we can get live on camera. Just slowly meandering down Twin Dams. Uh, Jamie and, and Hubert. Hubert's carried on on Kruger's track to see if she comes out of that area. I'm going to check uh, around that side. I'm thinking mm, Queen Karula. She might pull a sneaky one. So I'm just checking back down to where to whence she came from. There were no cub tracks with her. So it is possible if she doesn't successfully catch anything on Juma, she will return back to where the cubs are. Shafi's wondering, what's the difference between a wild cat and a Somali cat? Uh, I'm not 100% sure. I think it might just be another name for an African wild cat. Uh, it's possible. They are called different things all over Africa. But I've never heard of a Somali cat. As far as I know, out of the small cat species in Africa, um, you have, or in Southern Africa, we have uh, the really small cat species. I suppose we can do them all. So in Africa, we have lion, leopard, cheetah, are the three big ones, uh, of course. And then caracal, serval, African wildcat, black-footed cat, 
and oh, I'm did I say carry for them? Oh, no, let's start again. Let's not get confused. So, lion, leopard, cheetah, caracal, serval. We'll try to do them in size. African wildcat, black footed cat. So, those are the seven cat species. Sand cat. sand cat, we're getting there. Well done, yeah. Uh, seven cat species that occur in southern Africa. Now, if we head further north, the first new cat species we encounter, if my memory serves me correctly, is the golden cat, which is endemic to the jungles and rainforests of Central and West Africa. Golden cat. Then, now, if we head further north, <coughs> oh, excuse me, sand cat. So I think there are nine cat species. I might be forgetting of one, but I think there are nine cat species in all of Africa. Why don't you check on that for me? Double check. And of course, we're not in including Felis domestis, the domestic cat. No, sorry, not Felis domestic, Felix, Felis Sylvest, uh, the domestic cat. And uh, that is not an indigenous wild cat, but a very interesting thing nonetheless. I wonder if anyone can tell me why the domestic cat is called, oh no, sorry, why a certain cat? Oh, I've given it all away. Oh, I've made a complete hash of that. But I'll tell you about that in a little while. But Jamie seems to have her gremlins under control and is back on the road. They beat the gremlins off from their savage attack fiercely, or at least we hope we did. And we are back up and running with not a cat, but an equally unique and beautiful animal, considering we sometimes take them for granted. And we've just got a lovely picture of a mare and her foal having a little bit of bonding time between the two of them i can't even remember what i was talking about before i disappeared off your screen i'm sure it was something most profound and important naturally but never mind we shall start from scratch and the cat challenge is still very much in the forefront of my mind this is just too peaceful a scene to ignore. <laughs> Tails swishing furiously, trying to keep the flies at bay. And this posture that they've adopted, or at least this positioning that they've adopted, is relatively standard for a zebra. So it's not just about the bonding oh, and mutual face scratching that's happening, but it's also what um, Zebra generally, the sort of a stance that zebra generally adopt. You'll see one facing forward and one leaning against it in the opposite direction. Both allowing tactile contact, but also watching each other's back, quite literally. And then of course the useful face rubbing post also helps. Got a young zebra foal. Could it be the one that James witnessed the live birth of? just a few months ago, maybe. It's the right area for it, and it looks to be about the right age. Oh, time to go. The mayor has decided. <laughs> Pushing the young foal out of the way and onwards. Now, oh, this morning, he was pricked up on Karula's tracks, and he's been tracking her. I've dropped him off somewhere in this region, and he went to look around Galago Pan. I found her scat, at least I think it was her scat, sitting in the middle of the road. It caused a little bit of confusion just because it was a little bit small for Karula. And of course, this being one of the main roads, there were absolutely no tracks on either side of it. But there were monkeys alarm calling when we closed, when we finished off the sunrise safari. I raced through to see if I could find them and I didn't have any luck. But we've had a monkeys alarm calling at Galago Pan for the last few days. Aha! Well, <laughs> he was definitely went uh, off he goes. <laughs> A very brief sighting of he was, He's heading back to the last Karula tracks that he had. He obviously took my warning about the herd of elephants that were crossing towards him at a rapid rate. He obviously took that quite seriously. And there he is. <laughs> I was going to follow up on these elephants. I just want to contact him very briefly on the game. 
drive channel? No, that's okay. Let's leave him to go about his tracking. Let's follow up on the elephants while they're drinking around Galago Pan. And Lex has just called me to say that the guests there are heading out earlier. Oh, no. Hubert is coming. Let's just, let me just go chat to him very quickly. Now, it seems as though small cats are on everybody's mind, although we are on a leopard search this afternoon. Uh, you were wondering about Debbie in Vancouver. You were wondering about what signs you look for in terms of tracking the cats. And the answer is you can occasionally see their tracks. They're almost indistinguishable in the case of wild cats from a domestic cat track. Ah, sorry, bear with me, Debbie. I'm going to get back to you in one second. And four, are you happy to follow from here? How's it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, sharp. Thank you. I'm going to go follow those in Glove for now, and then you just contact me on Game Drive channel. Okay. Awesome. Okay. All right, yeah, come. It's a bit hard to go walking yeah, around in, in this many layers. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to let poor old Hubert dump his coat and everything, since he was originally going to be coming on the back of the vehicle with me. But since he does have tracks here, we're going to leave him be for now, let him do what he does best. You can pop here. Perfect. And we will see you later. All right, shopping for. Thank you. And off he strolls into the wilderness, hopefully to find us a leopard. We've got we've got an additional weapon on our side in this cat search, this cat challenge. Now, Debbie, you were asking about the signs of the small cats. Yes, we see their scat, although. African wildcats do often bury theirs, just like domestic cats, or at least scrape to cover it, just like the domestic cats do as well. I have to be completely honest, I, I have hardly ever seen African wildcat tracks while I've been out here. The serval and the caracal tracks we see on a more regular basis, they're a little bit more tricky to distinguish from something like a civet track, very, very similar, but they do all leave signs. The difference with the small cats, unlike their big cousins and the hyenas and the elephants of this area, is that they actually don't use roads all that often. One of those interesting aspects of their behavior, they like to remain secretive, and I think that they've realized that roads and that's, they probably, you'll probably find that they avoid the main game trails as well. For them, clearly, they can move, move stealthily enough, they're small enough that they can move stealthily enough without having to utilize roads, without having to utilize game paths. And what that means, as I'm sure you can imagine, is that their tracks are a little bit harder to spot. Now, Hubert, as he heads out into the bush, and I am aware that there's some confusion about how, how to pronounce his name. I've asked him a couple of times and he says it's Hubert. It's, it's Herbert. Herbert, not Hubert. Uh, obviously, that's, that's how he wants us to pronounce it. It's, sli it's spelled slightly different, but he wants it pronounced Herbert. Well, that's how he pronounces his name. Uh, he, of course, is an expert in following tracks off the road and off the beaten track. I can't claim to have the same degree of expertise. When you get to a place like this, you can just imagine. I mean, just looking at this, this kind of terrain, you can just imagine without a game path, what it's like trying to pick up a small cat track there. And we have an interesting surprise for you in terms of that wild cat sighting and the end of that wild cat sighting, but you'll have to stay tuned to Fireside Chat to find out. Oh, I remember now what I was saying. It was actually quite profound before I disappeared. And that was, please, if you have any questions you'd like us to address at Fireside Chat. And this evening we will be discussing hyenas, Inkanyeni, and the other leopard cubs of the area, and then the wild cat fighting. You are more than welcome to send those through to us in the normal way, which is hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or through email at questions at wildearth.tv. 
Right, these elephants were positively booking it in this direction. Let's see if we can get to the pan whilst they're still drinking. Nice warm off out here. Supposedly, oh, somewhere around 77 Fahrenheit. Feels hotter for what is essentially midwinter. I must say, the sun is beating down upon us. You winning there, Jandre? Would you like me to stop? He <laughs> got it under control. Yeah, every now and again, as we go through underneath a tree or underneath a low hanging branch, our antenna that sticks up behind us, you've, some of you have seen it on Bushwalk, you've seen it when we pass one of the other vehicles. We have to obviously put that down and sometimes it bounces right down. Which is not yeah, something we want to risk. We don't want to risk the, the risk of gremlins returning once again to our vehicle. So, where are these elephants? They were positively racing in this direction. But surely we can't have missed them already. Well, perhaps we can. This is one of the few remaining water areas, this pan. Just checking to see. No. There doesn't appear to be any elephants wandering out of the thick bush. Hmm. And no sign of Karula, or indeed those monkeys that were alarm calling. All is quiet here. Yeah? All right, well, Lex did tell me that he heard alarm calls from inside this drainage line. Uh, I think that's what we're going to go and do. We're going to go check around here, see if we can't spot whatever's causing this consternation. But I must say, I have a very strange feeling of deja vu. It feels as though I've had several afternoons in a row where I've wound up circling this pan, looking for whatever's disturbing the Franklins and the grey go away birds and the monkeys. And I'm starting to suspect that it might be some kind of bird of prey, although I haven't found it yet. Yeah, we did just miss the elephants got their tracks walking along the road. Try and find a nice clear example for you. Not the best, but you can see how flattened the ground is in the sunlight. Spaces where big flat feet have gone wandering. Oh, they came through here so quickly. See how they're on top of all of the vehicle tracks? Uh, they've obviously been through here very recently, and I can see from the crisp, clear lines around them that they are very fresh, so that we just missed that elephant herd. They obviously didn't stop for too long of a drink stop. Maybe even thinking about heading rather to the Voyatella Dam. that would be where they are. They would be at, at Juba Dam. I was thinking to myself, they couldn't possibly have managed a drink stop that quickly. They were clearly on a mission, and that is where they've popped out. Apparently, you can see them on the Juma Dam camera. But that is where we shall go. All the while, that is where I was going anyway, because I really want to check for tracks around here. Sounds as though they're still on the move and that they're only having a quick drink stop. Ah, and it looks as though we've encountered a... Oh no, there's Lex. I was about to say, it looks as though we've encountered a driverless guest vehicle. I 
he's doing the same thing I am, which is checking incredibly carefully in this drainage line around the lodge. It's always been one of Karula's favorite spots. Though she hasn't frequented it as much as she used to since she decided to den in the south. Oh, that was very kind of you. <laughs> Hi, guys. How's it? Still no tracks. It's a mystery. mystery. Yeah, I've left her a bit on Zoe's road, so he'll keep us updated. Right. Okay, Good cheers, night. guys. Since we don't have any tracks, let's go and follow up with those Ellies for now, and then I think a quick trip up to the Lions, and really we are just entirely far too spoiled for choice when it comes to this afternoon's drive. I'm sure that Cheetah Plains, the biggest problem, of course, for this cat challenge is that Brent is on his way to Cheetah Plains, which, as the name suggests, has a far higher chance of Cheetah than anywhere else in those nice open clearings. <laughs> we shall see. You never know, a cheetah could pop out here. Aha! Hello, little elephant. You guys were on a mission. Incredible how much ground you covered. Where's your mommy, little one? I'm going to stop here just because I don't want to scare the baby away since it doesn't have a mother with it at the moment. Hmm. Did you get left behind by the rest of the herd? Did your appetite distract you a little bit? Tiny young elephant. Maybe two and a half years of age. And just like a lot of our Ellie's at the moment, his eyes are watering considerably from all of the dust that's flying around. Although the rest of the herd have gone walkabout, determined to enjoy that sprouting acacia tree first. little one and even at oh I can hear rumbling behind this baby so it is not alone I would never have suspected it would be we're a little bit too far away from the Voyatella Dam and the Juma Dam for it to be that separated from its herd as you know elephants are exceptionally protective over their babies there's no way they would leave a little one, particularly what looks like a little female, behind. The bonds are far too close in an elephant herd for that to be the case. <laughs> so casual. Back foot behind the front. And I can hear lots of elephants moving about. And of course now the go-away birds are calling frantically once again. Not frantically, almost absent-mindedly. You go using those feet to uproot the plants. Still not 100% coordinated with that trunk. There's the rest of the, most of the rest of the herd in some quite dense vegetation. Wouldn't you love to know what goes through the mind of an elephant when they decide to move? What made that entire herd almost run to the spot? They really were almost running and they clearly haven't had a good water break. They clearly haven't stopped and had a long drink because the baby would have had a chance to splash itself and it doesn't look like it's been into the water at all. So if they did go past Gallagher Pan, they didn't stop for very long. And they were, when we saw them, they were doing what, ele what Brent always describes as the elephant water walk. And yet, that clearly wasn't necessarily the end goal. And that must have been a message from one of the females, the older females, to say, come, let's go. 
and quickly. There are good plants to be eaten on the eastern side of Mvubu Road. Whoopsie. Wrong way? Would you rather go the other way? Bushwillow coming under attack. Now, an adult elephant would probably eat somewhere in the region of close to between 500 and 600 pounds of food a day. This little girl, who has probably only just recently been weaned, although she might still be suckling every now and again from mum will need much, much less in terms of solid food. Probably somewhere in the region of 70 to 80 pounds of food in a day. Tail swishing around to swipe at the flies. stretch. And a very warm welcome to Rodney Bush, who is watching our show for the absolute very first time. And we extend a warm welcome to you, Rodney, and we are going to work on the assumption that we will be seeing you on safari many, many times in the future, since it does seem to become something of an addiction for those who stumble across us. Rodney, let us, please let us know where you are from. We love hearing just how far our show reaches across the globe. We've got viewers everywhere from Tokyo to New Zealand to the States, Iceland, all kinds of places. So we'd love to hear where you are from. And I'm glad that you're enjoying it. There is so much we have to offer. And we never manage to pack it all in in a three-hour afternoon sunset safari, nor do we manage it in our three-hour sunrise safari. But we are on every day, twice a day, and you're more than welcome to send through your questions or your comments. You can do that on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv. I'm just going to shuffle forward ever so slightly, so that we've got a slightly better view of this little girl. Oh! Oh, I see. It's all right. Cheeky little thing. That's quite unusual in a female. It's all right, girly. Hello. What have you got to say for yourself? Oh, you're very big and scary. Very brave. <laughs> you can't put yourself behind a bush again, girl. <laughs> <laughs> Rodney Bush was taken by shock and surprise <laughs> at our impromptu greeting. Oh, 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 that doesn't look very comfortable, girl. Sorry, Rodney, didn't mean to shock and surprise you. <laughs> but again, you are welcome to send through your questions and comments. <laughs> Sixteen Phantom is freaked out that I am reading the feed. <laughs> Another new viewer to welcome to our live safari. Well, you know, we have our ways, we have our means, and yes, we do. Because you can't go on a safari, a real-life safari, without being able to ask your guide questions. And that is essentially the idea behind our entire show. It's not just about the looking at the animals, it's about learning about them and having a conversation about our special characters. And we do have some incredibly special characters, from elephant herds that we recognize to leopards that some of the viewers have been watching for many, many years. They've watched their triumphs and their disasters. Leopards, lions, elephants, buffalo, and then some of the smaller things as well, the tiny little stories of life and death and beauty out here. I hope you realize that you've got lots and lots to look forward to. Sorry to freak you out though, I promise you I'm not that scary. 
<laughs> and Rachel, he's watching all the way in New Jersey. He was wondering how many muscles there are in an elephant's trunk. Now, there's some debate about this, but the general number is quite a wide range between 50,000 to 100,000 muscles. The reason there is such debate is because the trunk has a lot of cross-banded muscles. So it's got longitudinal muscles, it's got horizontal, vertical, and then cross bands of muscle. And it's, there's some debate as to where one muscle starts and the other ends kind of deal. The general consensus is a range of between 50 to 100,000 muscles. It is one of the most complex things out here and one of the most amazing. When you think of what an elephant can do with its trunk, from yanking down and pulling an enormous marula tree down to the most delicate of stroking of a young calf and picking up something as small as a toothpick from off of the ground. And I've got go away birds still calling and I'm really sorry, I know we're looking at a lovely elephant and you know how much I love elephants, but if I don't follow and try and figure out what these go away birds are calling about, I'm actually going to go mad. Well, probably not, at least no madder than usual, but I do really, I do really need to figure out what's happening here. Now, uh, Debbie, while we cruise along and try and figure out what got these go-away birds so upset, you were wondering if monkeys and go-away birds will alarm call at the smaller cats. The birds especially do, and that's actually how this morning when I was caught out when the wild cat made her rush, that I realized something was going on because the drongos and the cysticulars all of a sudden started alarm calling. Monkeys will do as well. Sorry, I'm not looking at you right now just because I'm trying to focus on what's got these birds so upset. But I am giving your answer my absolute fullest of concentrations. So they will alarm call in short, yes. Monkeys might not be inclined to alarm call for as long for something like a wild cat, which generally is not really a threat to them, not even to a young vervet monkey. But for something the size of a caracal or a serval, it will absolutely alarm call. Chandra, you can see it there, sitting up there. Can you see the starlings? The go-away bird is further to the left. <laughs> it's at the top of the tree, Chandra. <laughs> the one with the leaves. <laughs> um, keep going if you go at sort of mm, half past nine. Um, bit to the right of that, a little bit to the right, and there, 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 there. It's in your right-hand side of your screen now. Oh, right. There we go, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, that wasn't an easy spot at all. <laughs> what? You can't fly away. Oh, they're all so cross in the middle of this block. What on earth has got you so upset? There's simply no other thing for it. I have to go for a walk and to see what's got them so riled up while I do that. Brent's got a view and a slightly better view of a much bigger elephant than mine. So we've got a group of elephant bulls, uh, three of them, and they've one still drinking at Cheetah Plains Pan, the other two are sort of moving south. Look at that, isn't that spectacular? And here we can see the age difference. The bull on the right is probably 35, the bull on the left 25. So you can see quite a big size difference between them. But another sort of 25 year old bull is enjoying a quenching drink at the pan. Beautiful, serene sight. So Justin's wondering how fast 
can an elephant run with those big ears? Well, they can actually run pretty quickly, just in about 50 kilometers an hour, much faster than a human being, and they can also keep it going for quite a long time. And Really hoping that these big boys might just start playing in the mud, but they seem to be more content just to have a, a really nice sedate drink before moving on. I hope you guys are getting some great screenshots. the two, the older one on the right, the younger one on the left, plucking what looks to be young acacias growing. They just seem to have these big bulls it's not that sort of pandemonium and helter-skelter that you get with the breeding herds. They just seem to have all the time in the world to just struggle through the African bush. And there's a Gnormus, Gnormans arch rival, the wildebeest, who has the next open area over, the next male wildebeest, there he is, behind. <laughs> Having a look back towards the Ellie's, or the Ellie still drinking. So if any of you are relatively new to Safari Live, Gnormalus Gnorman of the Gnu is the wildebeest who lives in the next clearing. And uh, I've become quite fond of him at the moment. Well, the last couple of times I've checked on him, he's been doing quite well for himself. He's got himself a little harem of ladies. But for the first couple of weeks that we saw him, he was all on his own. But I think let's try and get, catch up with these Ellie Bulls. They are heading east towards the Kruger. Just the way they walk, they've just got all the time in the world. So relaxed, not in a hurry. They said none of that real helter skelter you get with the breeding herd. Now, a big bull like this can weigh up to about six tons, 6,000 kilograms, which I think is around 18, 19,000 pounds. And he's going to eat. About 700 pounds of vegetable matter in a day. No, not that much. Oh, well, 600 pounds at least of vegetable matter in a day. Drinks about 20 gallons of water. Now, of course, they can go for a little bit longer without water uh, if they need to, but if there's water available, they will drink every day. Hello, boys. I take back, yeah, I think he's just a bit bigger, but I don't think he's that much older. I think he's just a bit bigger of an elephant now, looking at them a bit closely. So I'd say they're all late, except for the one guy at the back. But these guys, late 20s. This guy might be 30, the one closest to us. This is the biggest of the three. Hey, mister. You see, there's that walk all the time in the world. Oh, big boy. You can see he's, from his body language, he's completely nonplussed with us. He's smelling where breeding herd's been on the road. You can see there's some dung and some urine there. So he's checking what the girls have been up to. And quite often you can find these guys trailing them. Here we go. <laughs> this is just, a, I love, love spending time with these big bulls. Incredible animals. Here come the other two. Oh, 
Well, Madonna is amazed at how quiet they are. For an incredibly huge animal, if they're not pushing over trees or shouting at each other, they are incredibly silent and can move through the bush very, very quietly. Especially when they're on the move like this, they're not really feeding, just walking. But I mean, even while they walk like this, they'll constantly feed. He's checking the next spot of urine and dung from the herd. Now, that herd from the tracks and the freshness of the dung I can see probably came through here late last night or early this morning. feeding as they move, occasionally picking up like that guy did there, a little snack on the way. We are in the sort of corner of Cheetah Plains where sometimes we are about as far from final control as we can get. So our comms can be a little bit difficult. Um, but Ashley from Missouri, I think is asking, if they break their tusks at, at quite an old age, does this already affect the way it feeds as they've become so used to feeding with them? Well, Ashley, to a little degree, they, they are incredibly adaptable. So they learn quite quickly to deal with that slight break in the tusk. But these gentle giants look like they might head into this slightly thicker area and start feeding. They could move straight through, but just, oh, he's still sniffing. I think he's still looking for the herd. He's not really feeding. He's smelling where they went. Now, it's not uncommon to have an older bull with two younger bulls like this. There we go. See, he's tasting the smell almost. Might be a bit of urine that's slightly more fresh there. So we can hear helicopter in the background and uh, it is full moon at the moment so the anti-poaching guys are out in full force. Let's keep moving so they'll be checking all around making sure all the rifles are safe. So I see. I just want to see where these elephants are going. I've got a feeling they're going to go into this very thick area up ahead here. Maybe not. They might walk straight through. I just mentioned that the could hear the helicopter, the anti-poaching helicopter flying. And Kathy in Tennessee is wondering, do we let them know who we are so they don't get confused? Well, Kathy, fortunately, most poachers try hide when they're helicopters. We are also in the Sabi Sands. That's a Kruger anti-poaching operation happening over the boundary. Look at this. He's coming right up to us. I'm going to walk right behind them. They're just such incredible creatures. But he's definitely on a mission, I think, trying to sniff out that breeding herd.
but as I said, it's, it's not uncommon to find multiple bulls together. We don't see it too often at Juma, and that's probably because we have a lot of breeding herds around. Uh, but in other areas where the breeding herds aren't so common and the bulls like to sort of hang out and there's not so much ruckus, uh, you get big old bulls often surrounded by younger bulls. And there's a wonderful old Swahili word that's, that's often used to describe them. They're described as askaris or guards. Basically, the protective unit to the big old boy. The hearing's a bit better, the smell's a bit better. Uh, and I suppose you could almost say that the big old boy is passing down a little bit of knowledge. I think that's not really the case here. I think they're all quite close in age. Uh, I don't think there's more than 10 years between them. But I think you can just shoot up ahead onto the next open clearing. Hi, Corral. In Atlanta, would like to know while the Ellies are moving like this, how many miles an hour are they travelling? I'd say at the current walking pace, they're probably doing in kilometres an hour, about nine, ten kilometres an hour. Uh, in miles, I'm afraid I'm not too sure. I'm just trying to predict where he's going to come out. And the sun is glaring at me. Going into those thickets there. There you go. Thank you, final control. It's about 5.5 miles. I'm just going to go ahead and turn around for Vim. You can see where these eddies are going to pop out into the clearing. on the trail of a breeding herd, just judging from his behavior. Have a look there. There he is. He's definitely the leader. The other two seem to just follow him, and he's got his nose to the ground, sniffing his way. The other one's having a scratch there, Vim, against that tree. Oh, he was having a scratch against the tree. Here come the two younger boys. They, they just have that essence of time. They're not in a rush. Just really, really sort of striding through. Not too fast, not too slow. And it's really quiet out here on the plains. There's a lone Cape turtle dove crying, Cape turtle, Cape turtle. And literally, apart from that, is something you can very struggle to find in the world is silence. Oh, look at that in the distance. Going towards the pan, we have more elephant balls. So I think we'll let these guys carry on into the bush to try to find the ladies who I think have already crossed into Kruger. And it looks like there's another two big any balls heading for a drink. So it might be nice to catch them there. They could be part of the same sort of group 
because you must remember elephants can communicate over vast distances with those low frequency rumbles uh, far and a lot of them are, are much deeper than we can hear but Brian Marshall is saying well when you determine the age of an elephant is it in elephant years like dog years or human years so of all the animals out here in the bush Brian elephants have the most closely sort of synced sort of life cycle with humans and uh, they live to be about 65 so it, it is very much in human years that we judge elephant age uh, let's see what these guys are up to I would like to come check on the other three we've been following a little bit later Through here, they've just arrived. Well, it looks like the builder beast was also going to go have a drink at the same time, so let's get in there. different ages. How's that BM? Would you like me to try and get on the other side of the light? So we're just going to try and move around them. Uh, the light's very harsh and we're facing due west. Oh, it looks like Norman might have lost a few ladies to his, his nemesis. He's, he's a bit older even than the other we've just been looking at. <laughs> you see, it's a very typical elephant bull head shake, just to remind us that he's a big boy. And you can see this guy's a bit bigger even than the last one, a bit heavier, probably, as I said, closer to 35 than the last one, maybe even a little bit older. Yeah, very noisy virtual standing behind us. Ivory, very even. What? Are the wildebeest having a silly five minutes? Or did something chase them out of the bush? I think they're just playing. Oh, look at this, they're going to cause some trouble with the elephant. The elephant doesn't like it. He doesn't know what the wildebeests are running from. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Even the biggest animal in the bush can get a fright from the cloud of the bush felt. Is the next one going to charge off? Now, wildebeest, when they start playing like this, can be very funny and that they really upset the ellies. The ellies are not sure why they're running and causing all this pandemonium. There goes the next wildebeest on the trot. Definitely just playing. <laughs> Stretching those legs. Beautiful camera work there.
such a peaceful sighting. Hi, Andrew. Welcome back. Haven't seen you in ages. Oh, welcome back. There's another three heading towards big bulls heading towards Kruger. So Andrew is back from leave and he's just joined us at this glorious elephant sighting. Here we go, the big boys and the wildebeests. You can see the size difference there. started snorting at what I'm not sure you never know with wildebeest they can just be silly and what are you snorting at wildebeest could be snorting to try keep his ladies in check keep them around, not going to visit the Norman, because they're good normless, out in the other open area. So there's a female there. But the one who is doing the snorting is just to the left, and that's the male. Oh no, I apologise. No, no, it is the male, yes. That's Gnormless is, is arch enemy. They sh their boundary is probably about 150 metres beyond us. Oh, and off they go again. Now, that's the female running in front. He's going to definitely try to keep the ladies from going to the next wildebeest's territory. Or possibly Gnorman is making a play and pushing into his territory there. Looks like another male wildebeest there that he's taken off to go chase. <laughs> that's probably what the snorting was about. Seeing off any possible competition. Well, they could just be going for a nice afternoon jog. We have some white-tailed, also not white-tailed, long-tailed shrikes making lots of noise as well, taking over the mantle from the starlings. Just something incredibly calming about spending time with big Ellie bulls. Mama Duke is wondering if we've ever seen any albino animals out on the reserve. Uh, no, I have not actually. Uh, oh, albinism is actually very, very rare in the wild. And there, you do see something called leucism. I've seen a few leucistic birds. Leucism rather than, or well, albinism is a complete lack of pigment in skin and hair and feathers. Is leucism is a lack of melanin, so a lack of the darkening uh, pigment that most animals, including us, share. Look at those beautiful tusks. Uh, but it's more common in birds. You can get leucistic buffalo and leucistic uh, giraffe, but it is it is very very rare, and especially out here. The only I'm trying to think, I haven't seen any leucistic birds or animals since I've been at Safari Live, but I have seen leucistic bronze-winged courses in the Sabi Sands before. That is 
about to have a drink and that big boy is going to lift its head now. Oh, isn't that gorgeous? So we're going to sit here with these big boys a little bit longer. I think they are going to move off shortly. But while we do that, let's go have a look at Jamie, who's got another animal that spends time in bachelor groups. Well, Brent sits with the big boys. We've found some big boys of our own. Not quite to the same degree, but nevertheless equally entertaining. A group of four buffalo bulls, or dugger boys, and one elephant. <laughs> and one hippo and, and so Buffles Hook Dam continues to live up to its sterling reputation since it is one of the few watering holes left for all the animals to come to. Oh we've got a showdown here, one very thirsty Ellie and one highly unimpressed hippo. Oh, the hippo is most definitely not silly enough to pick a battle with an elephant of that size but he's starting to feel more and more pressurized as the dam starts to go down it's no longer a safe zone and he's feeling pressurized and restricted although that hasn't stopped him from playing host to a terrapin that is currently hitching a ride and making full use of the fact that the hippo can't fully submerge in this, at this depth. The elephant and the hippo have, are eyeing each other up. The elephant is aware of the hippo's discomfort. The buffalo watch on with their usual expression of, what would we call it? Um, it's almost a disconnected look. It's a very distant expression that they have to their faces. It's actually quite a good reason for that. Science has shown that the brain waves of an animal that is ruminating very closely resemble sleep brain waves. So almost like rapid eye movement sleep. It's one of the reasons why the antelope and the bovids don't need as much sleep as we do. Here we go. Ellie and Hippo have reached the, a truce of a kind. Jenny, you were wondering as we watch our elephant slurp up the water. It's a wonderful word, slurp. It's fully descriptive of the way in which an elephant drinks as he drags up trunkfuls of water and then transfers them to his mouth. He wants to know exactly how much... Oh, Oh, Hippo's so unimpressed with life. You see that stream of water and air. Sorry, but you're wondering per trunkful, how much is an elephant bringing in? Between about 9 to 12 litres, depending on the size of the elephant. So this isn't a very large elephant, it's quite a young bull. Uh, he is probably taking in, if I had to guess, about 8. And please do forgive me, my litre conversions are not what they should be, so I'm going to have to leave it up to you to convert that measurement to gallons or whatever your preferred uni unit of measurement happens to be. I'm okay with pounds and I'm okay with feet, but litres, gallons, ounces and I, not ounces, but litres and gallons and I, have never really got on all that well. Interesting, elephant telling us a lot here with his body language. He's been slight, he's actually feeling slightly intimidated by the hippo. <laughs> and he's now been scared away by an impala as well. Oh, he's going to be so embarrassed. That was an impala, you silly Ellie. No. <laughs> if we go, we have a look at him. Yep, he wants, he wants to take it on. He wants to prove that he's big and scary. 
See that tail swishing and then a very, very clear sign with that head up posture. Elephants, yep, here we go. Here we go. Yes, you go intimidate that impala. <laughs> and the impala can't really take himself seriously, take the elephant seriously. He knows he's much faster and quicker and he's also very thirsty. Yes, you go show that impala how big and scary you are because you couldn't intimidate the hippo. <laughs> the Egyptian geese have taken off the impala. Really can't understand what this ridiculous show is all about. And I promise you, <laughs> oh, for goodness sake. <laughs> And round the other side. <laughs> if you're going to pick a fight, Mr. Elephant, you might want to pick a fight with an animal that you would actually be capable of catching. <laughs> yes, pretend that you came all that way to drink and that it had nothing to do with the Impala. Sure, we all believe you. It was just that particular patch of water that you really wanted, of course. I can't guarantee this, but I feel almost instinctively that that was a response to the fact that he had to back down to the hippo, or that he felt intimidated by the hippo, and he wanted to save face. And the reason I say that is because I've seen elephants do that so many times. Very often it's when they've lost in a battle to another elephant, and then they decide to come and take it out on you, sitting in your vehicle, because they think that you're the next best thing, and they want to try and intimidate you regain some ego. And unfortunately, it never quite works out the way they planned. Oh, well, boy, well done. You... <laughs> you've, you've scared that one impala away from your water. Job well done. <laughs> and as he grabs some more to drink in a slightly less intimidating distance from the hippo. Pinky Swear, you were wondering, do, is it true that baby elephants will suck on their trunks like human babies suck on their thumbs? Yes, absolutely they do. It's one of the most magical things to witness. You can see it purely as a comfort thing. And baby elephants, when they're first born, those trunks sort of flap around in the most uncoordinated of fashions. It takes them a while to get complete control, but they do suck on their trunks and they also grab their mother's tails as a comfort, as, as a sort of a tactile reaching out for comfort and connection. You can't help but love elephants. They're just the most extraordinary creatures. And they, of all of the animals, oh, yes, arabesque. And back to scratching your ankle. Yes, you can't, I mean, maybe I do it too often, but I can't help but interpret a lot of their actions through very anthropomorphic eyes. There's a lot of science to back up, though, the fact that they've got emotional intelligence second to no other animal out here except for us, out in the African bush. And probably only outmatched by dolphins, whales and the great apes in terms of their social and emotional development. The hippo showing signs of what's known as displacement behavior. So he was rolling around. The next step will be yawning, depending on how threatened. There he goes again. That is not because he's trying to cover his back. That is a visual cue. That is him trying to show off that he's big and scary, and it's called displacement behavior. It's not quite antagonistic or aggressive behavior, but it's a, just a couple of steps removed. The next step is for him to start yawning. He's already blown air a couple of times through his nostrils. 
and you might even grunt or make that typical hippo sound. And as I said, it's just because he is under pressure. There he goes again. It's, it might look like he's just trying to cover himself with water. It isn't that. Now, I can almost guarantee, having seen Sam sighting at this dam with this hippo and the elephants, and now from having heard about his behavior this morning whilst Brent was here with the lions, I can almost guarantee that if we drove down that to, close to the dam on that side of the wall, to view the elephant closer, I can almost guarantee he'd come dashing out of the water at us. It's very, very important visual communication that he's just shown everything around the water hole. And he's trying to just make sure that his space is not intruded upon. Now we've got this young Ellie bull drinking away. He's actually got quite an impressive set of tusks for a, an elephant of that size. He might even have relatively large tusks when he grows older. But uh, Petra, who is watching in India, we were wondering if our African, if within our African elephants, the females have tusks. And yes, they do. Both females and male African elephants have tusks, or savanna elephants have tusks, and forest elephants. There is about a 4% of an elephant population that has and is born without tusks. So. 4% of the population is the rough average around Africa. That, of course, unfortunately has been pushed to a much higher percentage in areas due to poaching. But there's a very small group of elephants that are born without tusks, and we do occasionally see them. Oh. Just heard. I'm not sure if you could hear that. Possibly not. But that was a from the hippo. Shame. Life is going to get very tough for him in the next few months. Petra, sorry, I will get back to your elephant question in a moment because there's quite a few differences that we can go over. But I just want to see his behavior. I want to see if he does that again. And you have to feel for a hippo uh, facing the situation that they are. Most of them have been moved out of this particular area, the Norland Sabi Sands. They have been caught and removed and taken to other reserves with far better water supplies. But these dams are going to dry up over the next, probably the next two or so months. And they are going to have probably nowhere to go except to move back towards the pans, the pumped areas outside the lodges again. Now, Pet and Doodles, sorry, just to go finish that train of thought, yes. All of the dams, the big dams, like Biffles Hook, Treehouse, um, Sydney's probably as well, and depending on whether they decide to pump it or not, Arethusa Dam Andrew, Andrew. will dry up. So, yes, they will dry. The pans or the dams outside the lodges, for example, there is Juma Pan, where the camera is situated, and there is Galago Pan, the lodges will continue to pump those as often as they can, depending again on the water table, because that water has to come from somewhere. But most of you know by now we are in for a really serious dry season. The next big rains are only predicted in probably around December of next year, possibly even January, February, and oh my goodness, I'm sorry. There's some very, very bright sun <laughs> shining in my eyes, Chandra, trying to shade me from it. <laughs> Thanks, Chandra. Try and keep my head still. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Now I'm seeing purple spots. But yes, we are in for a very serious drought. The dams are going to be completely dry. And, but worst of all, because there will be water available for the animals, the food is going to become in very short supply. Let's see what happens here quickly while this elephant walks past the hippo because he's still not entirely impressed with the situation and the fact that he got out. Oh, he got, he's going to pretend, I think. Oh, there's the air puff coming again, the hippo. He's going to just pretend that he's leaving just because he wanted to. Oh, and the hippo standing upright a little bit, but realizing that the elephant is on his way. And he will, oh, you see, there you go, looking backwards again.
he thought about challenging that hippo. And I think he probably would have if there had been another elephant in the area, another bull elephant. He's still almost thinking about it. You see how stiff his tail is? Okay, there we go. Relaxed a little bit. You could almost read his thoughts there. Am I going to be intimidated? Should I show this guy who's boss? Do I really want to pick a fight with him? Maybe not. You know, the buffalo are kind of deciding the same thing now as to whether or not they want to come squeeze past me or if they're quite happy where they are around the dam. It is starting to get late, it's starting to get a bit cool and they know instinctively that sitting close to a dam limits their escape routes as the lions start to mobile. Oh. One of the buffalo took offence to the presence of the other. And look at that bird. <laughs> Sorry, it's down there, Jandre. It's the other. It's the other left to the right. Here we go. <laughs> Having a jolly good dust bath. Awesome. just shuffling the grains of the dirt and the sand through their feathers which helps to remove parasites. It's basically like a, an oxpecker exfoliator. Oh, back to a buffalo which it will find some ticks. Oh, you're causing trouble Mr. Buffalo. What are you doing? Stirring, looking for an argument, looking for a bit of a fight. <laughs> We've got one off to the left of us that is having such a jolly good face rub on this log. Here we go, there's a nice spot. Oh, shame boy. That skin does look a little bit itchy. Most buffalo have some bald patches around their faces. This guy looks as though his skin's not in the best condition. And it's probably this constant rubbing and scratching that has left it as bald as it is. Well, yes, that's the spot. That's the itchy spot. Oh, and there by the horns. Is that better yet? Not quite. Still there, still itchy. It must be horrible having things like ticks living on you and not having thumbs to get them off. It's not like they can say to the ox pickers, hey guys, just, just go to that one tick that's on the, the left side of my right ear and just pluck it away from me. They just have to take whatever relief the ox pickers can offer. All better now, is it, boy? <laughs> yep. As I said, these buffalo boys won't stick around close to the dam as it starts to get dark. It's a dangerous place to be. First of all, the lions are going to start thinking about having a drink, which is why I was here, by the way. I got completely distracted by the parade of animals around Buffelshook Dam, but I was actually coming to look for the mating pair of lions, which we'll have to do quickly before we start heading off to War's fireside chat to get things all set up. Oh, Petra, I never finished chatting a bit about the differences between African and Asian elephants, although I think you, you will be fairly familiar with the most basic ones. Of course, our elephants in South Africa and in Africa, the tip of their trunks have two, um, what do you call them? Oh, for goodness sake. Two lips, whereas the Asian elephant only has one. 
And then the main difference, of course, being the size of the ears, which I'm sure most of you are aware of. The African elephant with it. Thank you, Jandre. Perfect. African elephant with its large ears and the Indian elephant with its tiny ears. So I just wanted to finish that off before we leave Buffles Hook Dam because I'm going to head off and search for those lines. While I do, let's find out how Brent's perusal of Cheetah Plains is going. Alas, poor Gnorman, alone, scent marking, lost his lady friends. As you can see, he looks forlornly to the south, where on the other side of this clearing, Gnorman's other arch emesis resides, and he has got the ladies. So these wildebeest bulls on patches of prime territory like this will not have a huge territory. It'll just be a few small hectares. So Gnorman's got the center part. There's another bull who's got the southern and then that bull we saw running around with the ladies who's got uh, the northern part of these open clearings. So when territory is correct for them, they don't need a vast area to defend. And this is prime country. So all three of these bulls are in the best condition of their life to be able to defend this area. Now, Vim and I spotted some cheetah tracks and the general direction was towards this area. Unfortunately, they looked like they might be from last night. Oh, see Norman scratching and marking all his sticks in his domain. Just checking under every bush at the moment while you guys are looking at Norman. Hoping for a head to pop. Well, with baby gnus wondering, are there different types of wildebeest? They most certainly are. We have two species in Southern Africa. The blue wildebeest, which we're looking at now, and the black wildebeest, which occurs on the high felt, on the grassland plains of the high felt. And uh, there are different versions of the brindled gnu or blue wildebeest, which we see. Uh, the, there's a white bearded, white tailed version, and that's the one that partakes in the massive migration in Kenya and Tanzania. Now, my favorite of all the different wildebeest, blue wildebeest variations, is uh, the Nyasa wildebeest. Uh, I don't have a picture of him with me, but uh, do yourself a favor, Google it. Nyasa, spelt N I A. Double S A. Smaller than these guys, they live in the Miombo woodlands and around the rivers. In they have little cross. Sort of uh, you get the Wangwa Valley in Zambia, but that's about it. We're going to come out here, but no such luck just yet. Now we are going to check back towards where we had last tracks. There's another road that we haven't checked yet that runs parallel to the park boundary, and that's where we. And it was VM's eagle eyes who spotted the cheetah tracks. Cheetah, I'm checking every termite mound, every pile of elephant dung. They lie so flat and with their heads up, and they quite often take on the shape of a pile of elephant dung. The last place we saw the tracks was about 300 meters that way. I'm going to go check this road here. It doesn't look like anyone's driven it yet. So fingers crossed. Uh, 
as I said, unfortunately, those tracks do look a little bit old. But we are floating on luck at the moment. And hopefully it holds, because they might have caught something in here. It's highly possible. But more than likely, they've managed to sneak through into the property to the south of us. But even if we don't, it's been all beautiful down here on Cheetah Plains with those magnificent bull elephants. Yeah, it's a nice big game bath to check. That'll be fine. Tracks here. That means the cheetah could be lying on the edge of the open clearing. You might not have seen them. I'm trying to see. I saw something that looks like the whisper of a cheetah track. I just want to double check quickly. Unfortunately, not a cheetah, but I do have a broad banded grass, yellow, fluttering around. Oh, there he goes. Beautiful little butterfly, but not quite what we're looking for just yet. Oops, sorry. Yeah, VM's got the broad banded grass yellow, is looking for a spot to spend the evening. And even though they look so conspicuous when they fly about during the day, you can see when they land, they do look quite like a leaf. So that's how they, one of their defensive systems. Now, just to throw another spanner in the works, let's look at this track a little bit more carefully. Ah, it nearly caught me. It's a monkey. Uh, just on the, on the edge of the hard ground there. Cardinal's wondering, would a tracker like Hubert understand the different alarm calls of birds? Yes, Hubert's got a huge amount of experience, so he, he would be able to decipher some of those for sure. It's such a welcome addition to our team. Unfortunately, my gut instinct, which is normally quite good, it's telling me those cheetah carried straight on straight down the Kruger boundary. We couldn't see their tracks because a herd of elephants passed over. But we will double check. So unfortunately, we've passed where we had the cheetah tracks that haven't come out. They have gone south, so, which means they have to come north one of these days. So going to have to be, keep checking down here. And of course, it is. Sorry. Oh, as I say that, I see something that makes me think, oh, oh, oh let's go back. Bless you, Vir. Say it's been walked over by a buffalo. Go a little bit further down the road. Uh, it's been driven over. It's an older track, unfortunately. So it is a Sunday, which means a wonderful day. It's fireside chat day. Bless you, VM. Sorry, I was very concentrated on looking at those tracks there, which means we are quite far. So. 
Um, we're going to leave the area of the cheetah. We're going to take one last, or the last cheetah tracks. We're going to take one last gander around uh, the cheetah plan, the cheetah plains plan, where we have this wonderful elephant, and then move through the area where we last had in Kanini's tracks, and we'll start heading back west, so I can join you around a fire shortly. So we're talking about the different cat species we get here uh, in the Sabi Sands and in Southern Africa in general. And Jaden's wondering, have we ever seen a sand cat here? Um, Jaden, we have not. Uh, sand cats are very, 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 very specific, specifically in the North African deserts. So they don't occur here, unfortunately. I have never seen one ever. Uh, I haven't been lucky enough to go carry around in the North African deserts yet. So, Chief's Plains Pad is across that open area there. I'm trying to see if I can see anything from here. Nothing big. I can see just a single wildebeest there. Fix my chair there. There we go, that's much better. One last gander, what say you? I think it's a good idea. What do you think, Vim? Yes. Such a gorgeous, gorgeous evening. Sun. So we are heading straight west towards the setting sun. crossed as we come across to the last of the open areas. One we've been to but has been quite productive for us today with those Ellies and Bullies. And Impala, they weren't here earlier. Moving out towards the open area as it's getting cooler. And when they are, they are just such beautiful animals and you can just see in this gorgeous light how stunning they are. Such graceful creatures. Look at that. Well, we've got quite a long way to go. So, we're going to start moving quite quickly back towards Juma for fireside chat. And there, the Ganoos. Still running. Bye bye, wildly beasts. Don't get eaten. Oh, there, there we go. That's Gnormland's nemesis keeping the ladies in check. Oh, walking straight into the sun. Well, Astralina has come up with a great idea. She thinks Gnorman's rival who's disappearing there uh, should be called I'm a Gnu too. What do you think, Vim? Is that a good name for Gnorman's arch nemesis? No, I like it. Vim likes it? Oh. Sold. Astralina? We have Gnormless Gnorm in the canoe, and I'm a canoe too. So I need to do some low flying. Uh, we'll be back if we spot anything on our ride back towards quarantine. But in the meantime, let's jump back on board with Jamie for a bit. Brent is 
the mad sprint back from Cheetah Plains. We're here to help you with the fireside chat setup. And obviously, once Brent makes it back into signal area, then you'll be with him for a little while until we have everything set up and ready to go for fireside chat for the last half an hour or so of the sunset safari. Oh, many of you may be wondering what happened when I went for a walk, actually. I sort of forgot to update you on that particular event. Oh, we've got panic. Don't panic. Don't panic. And I'll just let you know in a moment. That little baby Kudu, I think, set off that sudden run and leap from all of the Impala. Let's just stop for a moment. We'll have a look at them, and I'll tell you what happened while I was on my walk. The answer was not very much. I went into some very, very thick vegetation and I got to the point where I could not see a single thing in front of me. Oh, still, the birds were all calling, the grey hornbills, the go-away birds. Oh, there's a magnificent kudu ball. Anyway, as I wandered into the drainage line, I suddenly remembered that we're missing an Nkuhuma lioness that hasn't had her cubs yet. And at that point, I started to listen to my heart in my throat. So when a Franklin exploded out at my feet, <laughs> my, my heart rate sort of doubled. Look at that. Sorry, distraction from that story. We've got some serious courting going on here. And that female, the fact that she's letting that male do that tells us that she is very, very nearly coming into estrus. That chin resting on her back is a very clear precursor to mating. You've got a really nice comparison here between the male kudu on the left and the female on the right. Get an idea of just how much thicker his neck is and actually how much darker they are in colour because you don't often get to see them side by side in this way. He's managed to find himself a lovely lady. He'll spend quite possibly the next two or three days in this process, following her about and waiting for her to be fully in estrus before she will actually allow him to mate with her. And in that way, she allows the opportunity for a bigger, better and stronger male who might be a better, better genetic choice for her offspring to come along and to chase this other male away. In the meantime, we've got something similar on their mind, but for these young males, they've got another few years yet before that opportunity presents itself. Practicing their fighting skills. And then whole load of impala and kudu as well joining us here. Really quite a lovely sighting. Interestingly enough, I'm not sure if you, you must, those of you who have been watching the Juma Dam camera at the same time must have noticed the fact that there are some young buffalo there that are not Dugger boys and are clearly not associated with the breeding herd. So somewhere, chances are the lions have been causing chaos. It's usually the only time that you see sub-adults, like the ones at the back there, out of the presence of a large breeding herd. It might be my imagination, but they do look a little bit dazed and confused. But that could, have, that could have been days ago, potentially, that the lions chased them and separated them from the rest of the breeding herd. But I was telling you about my drainage line. Anyway, I checked really thoroughly, and I absolutely couldn't find anything, and I couldn't find any tracks. And I think I've come to the conclusion after that Franklin that was clearly quite comfortably pottering about very close to my feet, apart from giving me a, a fright, let's put it that way, to put it mildly, um, I actually think it might have been a snake that the birds were all alarm calling at. There were no birds of prey, there were no big cats in there. The only other option really was a snake or maybe a slender mongoose was also the other option. All right, we need to start heading towards quarantine. Uh, okay. Which we shall do.
Oh, oh. Oh, I thought that Kudu male was about to get lucky there. Sorry. One more second. Just to see. No, he's camera shy now. And you've got also a really nice comparison with Inyana at the back as well. Oh, and the fighting Impala. Oh, not yet. Not yet, but nearly. <laughs> oh, that looks like a recipe for a twisted ankle. I mean, we know because we've walked through there before just how full of holes and pitted that dried mud is. Jardre knows, definitely, because I've definitely seen him fall in there. Not completely, but he did disappear up to about his hip in mud. <laughs> Sorry, just chuckling at the memory of that. He still held the camera perfectly still, mind you, whilst on bushwalk, which is quite thoroughly impressive. Oh, we're going to get a Fleming Grimace. Are we going to get a Fleming Grimace? Ah. Oh. Disappointing. I thought that the kudu male was going to pull that typical face of a male that is scent testing. Obviously, he already knows that she's nearly ready. Oh, he looks so hopeful. <laughs> she's just not quite there yet. He's looking for the go-ahead from her, and he is most definitely not receiving it. Nice quick comparison between the female Nyala at the back there and the Kudu. I know it's difficult for you to get a sense of scale, but these are the two antelope species that are probably the most commonly confused. <laughs> escape! Escape enough of this! She's faked a phone call and off she goes. No, no, he's still there. Well, you've got to hand it to him. He is persistent. I could just imagine what she said there. Oh, look at that bush. It looks delicious. I've got to go over there. Oh, there's the Fleming Grimace. Uh, he's going, something smells delicious. Like a more receptive female. Since you've given me the cold shoulder, I'll see what else I can find. <laughs> he's worked out that she gave him the wrong number and he's on to the next on to the next opportunity <laughs> we must... there's the Inyala at the back the males on the left and the female on the right female much lighter and more tan in colour they're much smaller than Kudu are they've also got white spots as well as stripes All right, we do have to get her moving on, I think. We have fireside chats to prepare to. Let, you can ride on the back with me until Brent is back, back in better signal area, at which point he can take over. Plus, I kind of want to see what this kudu bull's up to now. He's gone off in search of greener pastures. I'm not going to stop for too long just because we do have to get things going. Oh. Ah. I would love to stay and just watch these kudu as they walk towards us in the afternoon light. He's a lovely little baby. He's just barely bigger than the Impala. No little one. It's okay. Really lovely to see. We don't often get to see kudu this out in the open. And really get to examine them. Jump, jump, jump. All accompanied by the gentle sounds of the dwarf mongoose as they scurry off to bed. 
<laughs> All gathering together. Oops, sorry. Calling to each other. Oh, one last morsel so quickly before bed. That would be me. Everybody else has left and I'm still trying to find food. <laughs> yes, everybody else has completely left this poor little mongoose. The rest of them have all, are all scurrying for cover. Don't worry. I understand, little guy. I understand. Time for us to head up to quarantine. I know that I keep saying that. Whoa, run, run, run. You've been left behind. <laughs> It's bedtime. It's bedtime. It's getting dark and scary. Whoopsie. I scared the kudu. That was not us that scared the kudu, by the way. It was the dwarf mongoose. It ra obviously ran over its foot. Sorry, Impala. Can I come through? Thank you. Really good question for the final moments of my portion of the sunset safari before fireside chat. Joan, absolutely, you are right. The reserve doesn't interfere in nature, in theory. So then you wanted to know, well, if that is the case, why then have the hippo been removed from this area? To explain that, I have to go back to the point at which dams were actually constructed here. Those are man-made dams, they are unnatural dams, and whilst they bring us such an incredibly wide variety of wildlife, what it means is that in the northern Sabi sands a hundred years ago, there probably would not have been hippo here. And the same applies to certain parts of Kruger and various other parts throughout South Africa. They've slowly migrated here because there have been large bodies of water in which to come and settle. But because they are man-constructed, it means that this area, when hit by a drought, is hit particularly badly because there are animals like hippo that would not naturally occur here. And this is going to, bear in mind, be the worst drought in the last hundred or so years, or so they say. So there's been interference for a lot of reasons. One of that is because hum actions of humans have brought the hippos here, and so it's up to us to help them out when drought strikes. It's also because they're going to pose a huge hazard once the drought does strike properly to man and animal alike in terms of the way in which things play out over the next few weeks. So that is why that level of interference has happened. All right, we're slowly making our way towards our fireside chat setup. Now, I don't want to give too much away behind the scenes, so you're not allowed to see any of it. I'm actually going to reverse. Of course, there's the fact that poor Connor is terribly camera shy. I wouldn't want to surprise him by being on camera. And since Brent hasn't quite reached the point that there is signal, Dave and Eugene are racing up behind me. <laughs> I was going to stop for the dwarf mongoose, but I'm, I fear I'm going to cause a, a blockage. Off we shall go, and we shall go on a loop around quarantine. What shall we chat about? <laughs> Connor's just waved us past with the most perplexed look upon his face as he tries to work out where we're going. They await all of the necessary stuff. Aha! A bird. Oh, it's beautiful in this evening light. This is a magpie shrike, also known as a long-tailed shrike. 
and definitely one of my favourite birds out here. Probably my favourite shrike species. Mm, maybe, maybe not. Not including the bush shrikes. I only hope Herbert makes it here as well. He's also been walking. So far, no sign of Karula. We know she's here. She's somewhere around here. No, it's just a matter of something that we can follow up upon for the sunrise safari tomorrow. Okie dokie. Well, I'm going to go and help everybody out at Fireside Chat. And while I do, let's head back over to Brent for the last few moments of the sunset safari. Welcome back. I just heard some good news on the radio. Some lions calling around here. And Jamie's on her way to set up Fireside Chat, so let's try and put a cat in the bag before the end of the sunset safari. Brian, Brian. Brian, uh, confirm you stopped on that open area on Ledwood. You say due west towards the sunset for me? One male lion that's in Chitwa. Copy, thanks. There's, yeah, there is one of the Birmingham's lying up in Chitwa Chitwa just across the boundary. And then how far to the east do you think? I'll just kind of check here a couple of lines. a lion. Seems like it's an elephant bull evening. Hello, mister. Young bull. Late 20s. Also trailing, possibly a breeding herd, possibly another bull. Well, it's always time to stop for a snack if you're a big elephant bull. All the time in the world. Well, we're just going to sneak past him. find what you're looking for. So many awesome elephant balls this evening. We are going to just do a quick scan through the block and see if we can find those lions on our way to Fireside Chat. Quite a bit. Quite looking, looking forward 
to you sitting around the fire. Also, uh, it's going to be lovely. I think we're going to have a lovely setting tonight. The sun sets, sets behind us and you get that beautiful sky behind us. And remember, the themes or the things we're going to be focusing on on Fireside Chat for your questions this evening uh, are the African wildcat, uh, just the general leopard cub update, as we saw in Kanyin, so we'll have a, and what's happening with the hyenas on Juma at the moment. for the fireside chat or if you want to ask me a question right now pop us an email on questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag safari live on twitter It'll be very interesting if we manage to find the honeymoon couple, uh, young Inkahuma lioness. So I'm pretty certain this will be her first mating, uh, and that Birmingham, either right now or more than likely on tomorrow's sunrise safari, and to see if that mating has escalated. They were mating very infrequently, which leads me to believe it was probably quite new, and uh, the chances are as they've go further and further uh, there'll be more mating this could however be a false estrus from the female because she is so young and who knows it could be to defend herself or protect herself uh, from the males and just to, to garner some interest from them but I think if I remember correctly she's probably three just over three years old now maybe a little bit younger so she, she could possibly mate at this age and uh, it's going to be wonderful when we've got lots of little lion cubs running around again. Speaking of little lion cubs, I heard the bestest best news uh, today from one of the other rangers is that they found uh, that the next stick lion, Styx lioness has given birth another four cubs. So there are eight Styx cubs now, which is really exciting news. And hopefully they decide to pay us a visit shortly. I love to catch up with some little bundles of lion joy. We saw one of our firm favorites on the sunset safari, Nelson, the one-eyed, one-horned impala with one ambition to avoid Queen Karula. Now, Catherine is wondering, would impala herds accept stragglers like Nelson, or is he destined to a life of loneliness? Well, Catherine, they most certainly would. Uh, at this time of the year, it's unlikely that he's going to be accepted into any uh, herd that has females, but he, can, he would definitely be accepted into a bachelor group. And then once the rutting season and the mating is over, he would definitely be able to hang around with a big herd of impala. So he more than likely got that injury in last year's rut. So he probably lost his eye and his horn fighting for the rights to breed with females. And wouldn't it be amazing to know how many he sired before he got popped off the pedestal, or if he ever even made it to the pedestal in the first place. I think it's just going to have to be one of those mysteries the bush will hold from us. So we're going to maneuver now towards quarantine. There's a chance those lions were in this general area. I think they might be possibly a bit further to our north, but fingers crossed, you never know.
Now, Paul Hubert spent his whole afternoon trying to find the Queen of Jumat, and she is a, a tricky one, as we know. But the last tracks were around Boyatella Lodge and Gallagher Lodge. So, keep an eye on that Juma Dam cam this evening. Maybe she will grace uh, you guys with the presents while the rest of us are in La La Land. And I did keep an eye out for a nearly impossible tree. But you guys are getting so good, it's making finding a nearly impossible tree harder and harder. But I will definitely be, keep, be keeping a watch out uh, over the coming week. There's got to be one or two more trees that will get that grey matter turning. I'm not putting on my lights so I can see where I'm going. I'm putting on my lights in case there's a track of a lion or a leopard. Ooh, you see that silhouette there, Vim? I think that's a good one. Who's got their screenshot fingers ready? I might have to pick up my camera at the same time. Try get into the best possible spot for it. Oh, I think it might have been a bit further back. I don't know. Where do you think? A bit further more. It's going to be a difficult one, but I think it might be worth it. Or maybe. No. I think it's going to be forward, but this is going to be our last little there. Oh, he's behind the stump. Uh, a little bit more, a little bit more. Actually, I think we're going to have to go for further forward. So have you got your screenshot fingers ready? Come on, come on. Is he going to clear the tree? <laughs> we'll show you what it is. It's just, just not working for us this evening. It's a vulture. There, actually, no, there it is. That's the one. What do you think, Vim? A vulture silhouetted against the skyline. The babblers are laughing at us. The babblers are laughing at our weak attempt at finding the perfect silhouette. And there he is. White backed vulture settled in for the evening. And we're going to have to keep moving towards quarantine. We don't want to be late for fireside chat now, do we? The smells are so different in the dry season. And there's this dust and also the smells of the animals seem to stay longer. I mean, I can smell a big herd of buffalo and I know they passed through here two days ago. So that smell's still there, especially as it gets a bit colder. Uh, the smells tend to stay around for a bit longer. So hopefully we'll be following our nose along leopard scent marks in not too long. one to begin and hopefully it'll be full of cats because this last week we had the cats but I would not say it was full of cats we had to work quite hard uh, we're lucky enough to see Kanyin and her two cubs we also got to see the Birmingham well 
two different Birmingham boys and two different Inkahuma lionesses. I'm trying to think. I don't know if we saw any other cats, Vim. Can you remember? Oh, African wildcat. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that's a cat. And uh, well, Dave and I had what we think was Shadow. Oh, we know she was there, but we couldn't really see her uh, in a tree. Oh, uh, we might, after all, be a little late for fireside chat. As we just slowly move past the breeding herd of elephant. Unfortunately, to go. Hello, Ellie's. Don't mind us. We're just on our way. Sit next to a fire. It's okay. It's okay. We're just going to move very slowly through them. Nice big herd. Oh. Uh, they're on both sides and the important thing with elephants is to just stay calm, move slowly, don't make any sudden noises. Yes, you're a very scary little one. <laughs> a little baby trumpeting at us. And if we look a little bit further back, see the adults are relaxed, uh, flapping their ears, feeding away. So we're not actually disturbing them, it's the, the little ones showing us how big and tough they are. Oh, all the dust from the elephants. And it looks like we are through. Maybe we won't be late. I don't know if anyone missed, keep an eye on the Juma Dam Cam this evening. Barula is in the hood. She's around there somewhere. We just weren't able to find her today. But hopefully she gets a bit thirsty and uh, needs to come for a drink. And hopefully does that right in front of the Juma Dam Cam. We're about two minutes away from the fireside chat. Vim, are we going to be late? Are we going to be in trouble? What do you think, Vim? Uh, we'll find a lion or a leopard. Yes, we'll be in trouble. that's it. I agree with Vim. If we find a lion or the leopard before we get to the fireside chat, we'll happily be in trouble. coming up now towards Vuyatela. Who knows, maybe Queen Karula will uh, make us late for fireside chat. Fingers crossed. Sorry, I thought I heard something there. I'm so worried about being late. I'm not even putting my jacket on. I'm bearing the cold to get there in time. I think we might just make it. We might not be in trouble this time. I've been in trouble a few times for being late for fireside chats. But sometimes the African bush has its own plans for you. And sometimes those involve lions and leopards. But it doesn't seem like it's happening just yet this Sunday night. So let's jump across to Jamie, who's probably a lot warmer than me, sitting next to the fire at Fireside Chat. Good evening and welcome to our Sunday Fireside Chat. If this is your first Fireside Chat, it gives you a chance to engage with us on a slightly more informal setting. This is the sort of traditional South African way to spend an evening out in the African bush with a nice fire burning in front of us and for once, no smoke flying directly towards us, making us sob our way through each and every fireside chat in the last few weeks. Now, as you see, I find myself somewhat bereft of company. James is on leave, Brent is rushing back, I can hear him even now. I can hear the accelerator of Rusty working nice and hard, and the odd elephant trumpeting in the distance. 
And just to let you know that Sam is also now on leave. He's been working incredibly hard for his first work cycle and joining us for the first time and it's such a wonderful and valued member of the team that he is. Unfortunately, like us all, he does need a break every now and again. So he's gone off on leave and he bids you all a fond farewell and he will be back in the not too distant future. What an extraordinary week it has been. Hard to believe. This time a week ago, I was sitting in the middle of the UK um, I headed back there for my graduation ceremony, got to see people that I have not seen in quite a few years and all of a sudden back on a plane, back here celebrating Sam's birthday and all of this happening in the space of just a couple of days, I've been feeling positively surreal. There's nothing quite like the grounding feeling of the African bush. Now naturally the first thing that I wanted to do was to head back across towards the hyena den and figure out exactly how things were going there and how the cubs have grown. You know that it's one of my happy places and uh oh, the smoke is coming, it's coming closer and closer. It's a toss up now, it's, a, it's whether or not it's going to blow towards Jandre or whether or not it's going to come towards myself. But yes, it's been an incredible week and the silence of a winter's evening in the bush is truly spectacular. We've got the wide open skies, we've got the prospect of a full moon rise coming up in the next few minutes and the glorious sunset happening behind me. The more astute or observant of you might have noticed that we shuffled a little bit so as to shift around to match the setting sun and also to help us with our smoke inhalation problem that we've been enduring over the last few weeks. Now Jane, before we get into the specifics of the fireside chat, you've actually got a general question for us. Now Jane is watching in Tennessee and would like to know why is it that lions and leopards, when they lie down, very often lie with their paws either upwards or kind of facing upwards with the pads exposed. And you wanted to know if there's a reason for that because you've noticed it as a general pattern. And I think there's a couple of things to it. I think that it's just the way that their anatomy works. They find that it is more comfortable. But also bear in mind that the paws, without any fur covering them, can actually be quite a nice heat exchange surface. So when they're not necessarily feeling too hot, but they'd like the air to just blow across the pads of their feet, it is actually one of the main cooling mechanisms that they can employ. The most important one, of course, being that panting that they do, dogs, cats, all do it, and especially when we see them with very full bellies. But in particular, that's why they tend to do it. I think it's just a nice, nice place for the wind to blow across them. And I think it also is quite nice when they've been walking on them. Our hyenas do it as well. And I mentioned that I went across to the hyena den as soon as I got back to Juma, just to see how the little ones were doing and to see if they were still around. We have prepared a very short little clip for you just to show you how much they have grown if you've missed out on those sightings and to, to explain a little bit about the dynamics between the different members. Have a look at this clip. We are very much in luck. The hyena have shown them once again, and shown themselves once again at the Aubrey's Road Hyena Den. It's hard to believe that these are the same little monsters that we saw a couple of months ago, tiny, uncoordinated, without any spots and dark brown in color and wrinkly, with skin that seemed much too large for their bodies, and those weak back limbs that sent them tumbling. Just a little brief overview of my surprise there at seeing just how much the cubs have grown. And also, surprise, here is Brent. He has Hi, arrived. Everyone. He's arrived very much on time. You weren't late at all. I know. I was worried that big herd of elephants was could possibly cause a bit of lateness. And then, of course, as I drove in, the lion starts roaring. And, and, oh, <laughs> there, wait, I'm, I'm back here, so I'm with you guys on, on fireside chat. Now. Thank you for not leaving me all on my own. I know. I was I would tempting. Have been quite, would be quite distressed. <laughs> we were just chatting a little bit about the hyenas at the hyena den at Aubrey's Road. Everybody told me they'd moved. I was quite Do we quite get disappointed. hyenas here? 
Um, I'm, I'm not sure if you've ever met them. There's okay. a whole clan okay. and, um, and they have names. Do they? <laughs> yes. And on the subject of names, that's actually one of the questions that we have been asked about the hyena dynamics. Just because we've got so much going on at the hyena den. And we started watching this particular set of cubs from essentially basically from their first emergence from the den up until now where they're between five and seven months old and absolutely full of nonsense, very full of curiosity. And given, they've really given us a fantastic perspective into the dynamics of a hyena clan. Because of course within a hyena clan you don't, they aren't necessarily, it's not really like an elephant herd where everybody's related and the, the older females take the lead. They've actually got several what are known as matrial linear lines in terms of you've got females and their her offspring, maybe her sisters as well being part, and then a separate group of females. And they're all part of the same clan, but they have different hierarchies. And we had a question through from a Kathy in Tennessee about, is Madam the, still the matriarch of that clan? And what, how does she fit in with all of the dynamics and what's going on there? So just a quick explanation, because I, I'm going to take this from here. <laughs> no, go for <laughs> it. Right. Um, just in terms of the current dynamics that we've witnessed. Yes, she is still the matriarch. As far as we can tell, her reaction, every single hyena is submissive to her and every single hyena is submissive to her cubs. Her current cubs, set of cubs, the January twins, are still there. Now you wanted to know, Kathy, about her offspring just because you've lost track. We think, we don't know, we think, Corky and Pretty are also related to her. They're certainly high-ranking individuals and they demonstrate that in their reactions to other hyenas, but they are still submissive to her youngest set of cubs. How that means they're related to her, they could be sisters, they could be eldest daughters. I did notice that Corky's actually taller than Madam, but Madam is just probably one of the stockiest hyenas I've ever seen. She's just, she's built, she's huge. Um, so that's a quick, a quick rundown. Madam's also got a cub known as Bella, um, who's now not actually a cub, she's a sub-adult of sorts. Um, he, sorry, he is a sub-adult, Ntumbela, Bella for short. And he, as a, as a clan male, but as a male of the matriarch, has an interesting little slot that he fits into, and I think oh, he might be sticking around. Again. Oh, there's lines calling there and there. Oh, how wonderful. Anyway, that's, that's the quickest rundown that I could possibly give you, Kathy. And we can talk in more detail when we do get to the hyena den. But you've had an extraordinary week, apart hyenas aside. Yes, no, we have been quite lucky. And the cats have been giving us quite the run around this week. But, uh, As we was, can hear. Yes, they're there and there and nowhere near here. Well, I wouldn't mind them being behind us at the moment. But uh, we went down to Cheetah Plains and we were searching for cheetahs. We do quite often there. But also the nice thing about Cheetah Plains is there are some other leopards we can possibly see there. And... We got to see the incredible Inkanyin and her two cubs. So let's have a look at this little clip of them. Inkanyin, she's a beautiful female. Now, go, there come the cubs. Isn't this exciting? Look at that, isn't that wonderful? We're just gonna keep still, she is moving towards us. Look at those little round rotund bellies. Obviously, and Kanyen's been keeping them well fed. Oh, look at that shaft of light coming out from the clouds behind. Now, wouldn't it be incredible if that shaft of light was popping through right on them like a spotlight on a play? Look here. Yeah. Look at that. Look at that shit right here. We've got a cub. It looks like the cubs are going to cross either side of us. That's in Canyon. Oh, you can hear that little contact call. Ooh. Now we've got decisions. Here's the little boy. And behind Dave is the little girl. But we'll stick with the little boy. Absolutely magic. 
wasn't that absolutely spectacular so that was the first time those cubs have been seen on the live drives i've been lucky enough when i had uh, friends of mine on honeymoon i saw them when i was driving out of juma vuyatela but that was the first time to share it with all of you and it was really spectacular fortunately unfortunately not the longest sighting she did eventually move back into Ankoro and then eventually into the kruger national park but I'm, I know Jamie's a little bit jealous about um, that. I, I'm sitting here trying to contain it, but I am exceptionally jealous because I have, I have yet to see Nkanyeni on her own, and I certainly have yet to see her cubs. And I was jealous when you first saw them, and I'm still jealous now. But I shall contain it. There will be opportunities. So Diane was wondering about the correct pronunciation of Nkanyeni. And we uh, fortunately have Hubert in the darkness behind here, and I yelled across while we're watching the clip, Hubert, how do you say it properly? So it is with the I. I have been incorrect. I do apologize. It is in Kanyeni. Um, I made exactly the same mistake that Brent did and, and James shouted at me. Yes. Um, and he, he, he did give me quite a lesson in the fact that we have a tendency to, especially with the Shangan and local names, drop that final vowel at the end. Um, we do the same with Shambambala Na. Yes, you know, in, so, in Zulu and Swahili and other languages, you would drop that. So, um, James is our, uh, as, as, well, obviously not, but Hubert's our Shangan local expert. But James, yes. uh, in terms of uh, all of us, can speak the best Shangan by far. So, I mean, a really, truly extraordinary sighting from what I saw of it. it very pretty. Yes, and it's so nice to see a male and a female cub and to actually already start to see the size difference between the two. And from what we can tell, we're getting the same indication from Karula. We never fully managed to figure out what the sex of the second cub is. We know one is a male, but we strongly suspect that the second is a female. So you immediately start to see the difference in their personalities. And we've been fortunate enough to spend a bit of time with a Karula, but we have yet to actually spend any time with Shadow, her daughter, yes. and her remaining cub. Well, Dave and I had a tail. A tail. A oh, tail. You saw, yes, oh, a you tail. saw a tail. A tail. Oh, I thought you were going to say you have a story to tell. Yes, okay. well, a, tail a tail and a tail. A tail, a tail, a tail, tail. within a tail. Ah. So uh, we got the call that Shadow was moving towards our southern boundary and we rushed there and was hoping she were going to proudly stroll straight into us. And uh, she didn't. So she stopped about 50 meters uh, away from us and she went up a tree. And then uh, while we were sitting there, I saw, the, saw this movement at the base of the tree and then the other guide who was inside the other property said listen the cubs just arrived and we left so there's only one cub no one is sure how it has died there's been speculation whether it's hyena whether it's uh, lion leopard more than likely just because of the area she's been hanging out in i think it's, there's a strong possibility it's another male leopard and uh, i don't want to say this too loud but one we all have uh, Konyuma was seen quite close to her den site a oh, few I times. Oh, I didn't think about that. So uh, I think that's possibly the most likely uh, uh, scenario which has happened to the second cub. So the, she only has one cub at, at the moment. Yeah, um, no, it's an interesting situation because of course, as we know, most of the recorded, or at least the majority of recorded leopard cub deaths are through unknown male leopards or other male leopards. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the mistakes happen, and it's, it could possibly even be their father, but that's relatively unusual. Uh, as you know, we never know exactly what the paternity of a set of cubs is like. And James Richards, you were wondering, because a female leopard mates with as many different male leopards as she possibly can, you wanted to know whether or not that's actually one of the reasons why they have evolved the, the rather complex method that they have in order to induce conception in order to induce fertilization. And I see exactly where you're going with that because obviously it's with all of the cats, it's induced ovulation. They require repeated mating sessions in order to actually physically ovulate and for fertilization to occur. Uh, interesting theory. I don't think it's that though. I think it's the chance that that has evolved in terms of being the best possible way to prolong that period of or that moment up to fertilization to allow a bigger, better male with better genetics to come so, through. And, and also, and you'll see that when in looking after cubs, the females spend a lot more effort and a lot more time with the male cubs. They leave the female cubs, uh, they become independent at quite often a year, year and a half before the male cubs do. Now, the reason for this is that female's genetic line has more possibility to get into other genetic lines through a male because he is going to mate with multiple females. 
And then another interesting thing That's actually about... That's such a good... I've never thought about that before. Yeah. That's a really interesting point. So, yeah. So, and another reason we've been asked recently about why we're not seeing so much of Karula around her normal yeah. spot. Well, I have a theory, and I think it's to do with the hyena clan. Mm. So, the hyenas uh, is just up here, to, over my shoulder here, uh, whereas before it was further down towards the southern boundary, the clan spent a lot more time. The clan has also grown incredibly since I've been here, and Karula's preferred den sites for her most of her previous litters have been around the Gallego drainage lines. Now, there are three different hyena dens that have all been active in the last three months in that exact area. So I think she's moved further south. There seems to be a lot less hyenas in the south and the east. So that's possibly why we're not seeing too much of Karula. But One interesting thing about that though is that she's pushed south towards little Gary and Hoffman's and those sorts of areas. And of course that's where the Styx cubs have been, or where the Styx females I did tell have everyone. I did tell everyone denning. today. Oh, you told them the good I news. I told them the good news. Uh, yeah, not leopard cubs, news. but lion cubs. So there oh, are so eight exciting. Styx lions cubs at the moment. I'm sure you're um, all champing to see them. Me I too. We are. <laughs> so... Dr. Debbie's wondering about the pregnant in Kahumal Ines. Uh, she would like an update. Jamie? Um, I, I don't have any updates for you except that she is missing. It did occur to me whilst following alarm calls in a very thick drainage line this afternoon that there she might possibly be there waiting to uh, alert me to her presence. I knew it was unlikely but the thought did, did flit across my brain at one point especially when a Franklin shot up from the grass right <laughs> beneath my feet. You know that moment? Yes. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, well, Dr. Debbie, I know she spent quite a bit of time hanging around the drainage line out of Buffalo's Hook Dam. Although, uh, since I've been back, I haven't seen all five Nkumas together, but they have been seen together to the west of us. So, I'm not so sure. I, I would really like to see them, and I'm not going to try to speculate until uh, we what, can actually see we them. Do. Yeah, so Absolutely. we'll let you know as soon as we do get that. So many exciting prospects. And then of course we've got the fact that we're going into winter, honey badger sightings this week, and then of course the highlight of my week, which was a very special wildcat sighting from this morning, just to return the jealousy. Very jealous. <laughs> what we found? I think we've either found a genet or an African wildcat. Look at that. That, look like a that is not a genet. That is an African wildcat. How absolutely incredible. That's a first for me out here. Look at that perfect red tinge. Now you can really see what I was talking about behind the ears. That is one of the distinctive features of an African wildcat. They're incredibly secretive and of course being so small, they aren't often seen, especially in summer. That's why we're so lucky to be going into winter now. Hello, gorgeous. I'm actually going to take the spotlight right off it now so that you get the full effect of those eyes. Hey, oh, stalk mode. Yeah, there's a huge breeding herd crossing to Sydney's. Oh, there he goes. I cannot stress enough for new viewers. How rare the sighting is. Oh, look at that. As we sit and listen to the lion's call, brings to the end a very exciting day for me. My first African wildcat since starting working on Juma for Wild Earth and doing these live safaris. And I think that the excitement may or may not have come through in my voice as I squeaked my way through it initially. It was very embarrassing. Definitely went up about two octaves. I'll try not to do that in the future, but you could get the excitement coming through. And of course, I promised you a surprise in that clip, and that is the fact that the final control ladies managed to slow down that final moment, because of course, the story behind that is we sat with that cat for two and a half hours, and it, was, it hadn't moved in the last 45 minutes, and by it hadn't moved, I really mean it hadn't moved. And it just chose that moment, as I turned around to 
untie my hair and retie it because it was blowing in my face and Viam I think was distracted by something else went forward and Safari Dean had asked me earlier whether or not it had to, whether or not a wild cat would go for something like a scrub hair there you go it caught a scrub hair I thought it had caught a drongo just because the drongos were all flying around and it was chaos and my hair was flying around and I was trying to grab the wrong radio mic to call for a crash cut it was, it was highly entertaining. I wish you could have seen our expressions when that happened. You can just imagine it though. Uh, absolutely it was incredible. So the answer to that question about whether or not the wildcat caught anything? Yes, yes it did. It caught a scrub hair. You also wanted to know, Debbie I think it was, how big the African wildcat is. It's about, it's roughly the size of a domestic cat. It's a little bit taller than your average domestic breed. Of course we've got so many domestic cats out here slightly longer limbed i mean i'm sure you've seen loads of wild cats in your I've life been very it's lucky. absolutely incredible uh well, don has actually pointed a very, a very important thing that i'm quite a a big uh, soldier on and don is asking whether any of our staff have cats no it would be highly irresponsible to have a domestic cat in this environment Firstly, they taint the genetics and of the wildcats, so they can hybridize with them. And it is one of the biggest problems facing African wildcats throughout Africa is hybridization with uh, domestic cats. Also, they bring in disease, and disease an African wildcat might not have immunity to. And those feline diseases can easily jump through to other, other cats, other smaller cats. So, Debbie, no. But with the African wildcat, you get domestic cat, I think it's a tabby, what, what, that yeah. looks semi-similar. Very it, similar. It's just the coloration for me is different, it's slightly more tan, and the ears, yeah. the pink ears. Well I know a lot of viewers out. were saying, you know, are we, how do we know we're not just looking at somebody's pet cat? I had to say, I promise you, this is, this is the most African wild cat looking African wild cat I have seen in the wild in a long time. Yes, no, no it was definitely an African wild cat. And, uh, you can just see see their movements and with those slightly longer limbs when you when you watched it stalking you saw those shoulders mm -hmm. they, they got longer shoulders they got with those longer limbs so if you watch your domestic house cat stalk those shoulders don't come nearly as high as that wild cat and you see how flat he got to the ground and you could definitely see those longer limbs and the shoulders as he was stalking forward yeah. And then, of course, there's also the fact that we're very fond of the birds that visit our gardens. Yes. And I'd, I don't think we'd appreciate a cat coming in and removing any of the birds from the trees. Not only the birds. Uh, domestic house cats are responsible for 80% of the avian extinctions in the last 100 years. So if you do choose to keep a domestic house cat, please put a bell on it. And every cat owner in the world says, but my cat doesn't. I promise it does. They are incredibly efficient little predators. And it's not only birds, it's geckos, snakes, insects, moths, I mean butterflies. Mm -hmm. They are so perfectly designed for hunting and killing things. Yeah. But, I mean, that aside, we had a long chat about that. We had a long chat this morning about the ethics of domesticating animals as well. And we were talking about wild animals versus domestic animals and, and where, where it's appropriate to draw the line. Because, of course, what, this, what the sighting did for us was it just reminded us of all the amazing little cats that are out yeah. there. And I know that you were discussing we that, long chat about, about that yes. on the drive this afternoon. Because there, there's just so many of them out there. And so far, we've ticked off Serval and African wildcat. Wild Caracal missing. Caracal missing. But um, if any of you ever get a chance to get to South America, South America has got the most amazing array of little predators, cats and dogs, uh, that occur. So it is definitely high on my sort of bucket list to get to, to go look at those incredible little predators. Now the first thing I did when I got home from that sighting was actually rush back to read my copy of the Stevenson Hamilton book, The Wildlife in South Africa. So yes, absolutely, I am still reading that. It was from Hannah, I think yes, it was. Yes, oh, Hannah, Hannah thank you very much. You were saying, I think you've got the similar, or you've got the same book, and you were saying there's a section in there about the African wildcat. And it was was once upon a time described in a word that I'm not going to say, Brent's not going to say it, is a, a word that has very strong Afri South African connotations, a very negative word. Um, obviously this book comes from a time around the early sort of 1940s uh, when such terms were not taboo, but it was a word that jumped out of the page and actually gave me quite a fright because uh, in his time they'd, they'd realized that this was a, a separate wild species, but it was still kind of seen as 
not as important as some of the other little cats. It's kind of just a cat. Yes, and, and, and quite often, I mean, if we look at the history of Kruger, and Stevenson Hamilton was the first warden of Kruger, all predators were shot on sight. Wild dog, cheetah, lion, leopard, um, hyena, both brown and, and, and spotted, to conserve the, the zebras yeah. in the impala. So, and and such was our under or their understanding at the time. And, and that's an amazing thing if you look how Kruger, how far Kruger has come since then. And now we're sitting part of the greater Kruger. I mean, most governments in, 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 in that area open a national park to private sector. You must be joking. <laughs> but it is amazing how, how the conservation ethos in South Africa has, 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 has developed over these years. And our understanding has developed as well. It was the amazing thing about that Stevenson Hamilton book is he wrote it right at the end of his career and actually quite close to the end of his life. And it was like he'd come to this realization that the more interference, the worse things got, the more worse um, things became. And he actually says it specifically in his introduction, saying that nature actually has a way of handling her own problems and that we actually don't really know all that goes on and now 50 years later we're still discovering yeah we are, 60 years later we sorry. are gardeners in eden we go take an absolutely perfect wonderful completely entire system and we start oh i want to put a tree there <laughs> dig a hole I mean, we're real gardeners and, and and if you look at the great sort of really incredible wild places left in africa they have been left alone to the most degree so it's, it's very, very interesting how, how perceptions have changed. Uh, even with management, yeah. management now is far more hands-off than it was in the past. We don't get involved um, if an animal's injured. If, uh, yeah. There are certain and circumstances. And of course we just spoke we, about yeah. that today, this afternoon, about moving the hippos from this area because yes. they've been brought here yes. by man's actions. Yeah, so the, the, the development of the, the man-made dams caused hippos to migrate from the Sand River. And you, now we're coming into a drought, there's no grass. It, there's no grass, no grass for them. So, it's one of those things. It's, uh, it's a very interesting thing, and, and and I don't think anything's right or wrong just yet. And uh, Tammy Peterson, I cannot think of a more appropriate time just to sort of broaden up the subject slightly. I cannot think of a more appropriate time for us to have fireside chats, but during winter. Yes, we, in fact, we truly appreciate the large, very warm thing in front of us. I have to tell you Dave, something that... Dave, next time make it bigger. Bigger, we, we, bigger we're fire. Quite, we're quite far from it. It's a bit chilly. <laughs> in summer, when it's sort of 35 degrees or close to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, still after dark, and you're sitting there thinking, I don't quite like to get as far back right, from this exactly. burning thing as possible. Yes, we will be having fireside chats. We're not guaranteeing them every single week. But when we've got but, something interesting you know, like the wildcats nice in Canyon to chat about. A little bit of a surprise every now and again. And the, the same goes for our Facebook Live appearances after drive. Yes. Those will be roughly, Sporadic. roughly every two or three times a week. Just depending. Yeah. So guys, in case you joined a little bit late and wondering where Sam is, he is off on leave. So don't worry, he, he, he'll be back in a few weeks. Yes. And, uh, and of course... James will be coming back at the end of the week. <laughs> James Richards has raised a very valid point. I'm sorry, I can't die. I can't play the guitar and I can't sing at all. In you fact, don't you want hate, me to sing. You really don't want either of us to sing. Um, and James Richards, you were wondering, could I not have played the flute? I somehow felt that a little bit of subtle Vivaldi whilst around the campfire didn't have the true South African theme. But I'm working on it, James. I'm working on it, I promise. At some point, I will have my arm twisted into it. Thank you to all of the cameramen, not just from us, but also from all of the viewers who I think really appreciate the hard work that our fantastic and the talent that our fantastic cameramen that do That is very, have. very true. And just most especially thank you to you all. Yeah, thanks and for watching. And since week. you don't have a song, I'm going to have to leap across the fire. Oh, my word, I was terrified there for a second. Okay, you're... here we go. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> have a wonderful day. <laughs>